All right, welcome everybody. We're going to get going here. So, um, welcome, welcome, welcome to our forecasting uh, parent information night. Um, I'm Stephen Russell. Uh, I'm one of the counselors at Blanchett. I've got students' last names L-E through R-I. With me is Ms. Covert. She's our academic and college counselor uh, this year um, and has been a part of our team for uh, many years now. Um, and we're going to be talking through the uh, kind of ins and outs of um, the kind of how, how we go through forecasting and advising with your students. Um, so the, the um, overview here is that we gave your students this presentation yesterday morning. So I'm sure they came home just absolutely excited to talk about picking their classes for next year. So we're going to talk about we're, it's it's almost slide for slide the same presentation, but we're going to be framing it for you guys to help them pick their classes. Um, so this is also being recorded. Uh, so if you miss any of the jokes uh, or the finer details, you can always go back and rewatch the whole thing. We're going to try to get it up onto that website tomorrow. Um, so I will turn it over to Katie for the first part, and then uh, I'll rejoin you in a minute. All right. Hi, everyone. Mr. Russell. <laughs> this is one of those technical difficulties. Yay. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so um, for those of you just walking in, um, there are seats over on this side, plenty of space to see. Um, you can still download the slides um, from where we are today. So um, like Stephen was saying, we talked through all of this information with your students, and one of the things that we started with was saying, we're gonna cover a lot of information, but please know this process goes for the entire rest of the month of February. So yes, we're gonna talk about some dates tonight and there are freshman forecasting meetings starting tomorrow morning, um, but this is not a jump off the block and we're running to the finish line right now. We have lots of time to be meeting with your students, for them to be talking with you, talking with their teachers and making educated and informed decisions about what can be sometimes a stressful, but also hopefully exciting process, thinking about the opportunities that they get to do um, next year. And I think it's honestly really special um, to see how many of your students get on, like, anxious and nervous about this process because it means that they care about the classes that they get to take. Um, they're not just moving through this process saying, yeah, I don't care, sign me up for whatever. They're engaged, they're in our offices, they're excited to talk about opportunities. Um, and I imagine that's why a lot of you are also here. There's some anxiety, but hopefully also um, some excitement. So just a couple of things. Um, we'll talk about like the general overview. We'll get into things like graduation requirements, college requirements, how those two things kind of coincide. Um, thinking about kind of that four-year course plan. So for those of you who are um, upperclassmen parents, um, you'll have heard a lot of this information before and you're sort of on the back half of this trajectory. And then for those of you who are freshmen and sophomore parents, um, some of this will be an opportunity to look not only at the year ahead, but at the years ahead in terms of that planning process. Um, and then we'll also cover the, what the actual forecasting steps look like. So the process that we talk with your students about, how they will physically log into the computer and make their choices um, once they're informed and feeling confident about what comes next. Okay, so a really important thing to note is that the outcome of the forecasting process is a request for classes. It is not a schedule, it is not a guarantee um, of what will be in your student's schedule next year. It is a request for the classes that they want to take next year. The academic office works really hard once all of those schedules, um, those, those requests for schedules are made, and they work to create that master schedule. They're taking into account how many students need to be in certain math levels and how many electives can we offer. And then they think about the teacher schedule and the building schedule, and they put all that together, and then the students get registered. So there's a whole process that has to happen after students make their requests. But those requests are so important because they help the academic office try to make as many students happy as possible and get them the classes not only that they need, but also that they want. 
So schedules, hard copy schedules or, or email, kind of depending on what paper we're saving um, in June, will be delivered to students. So between now and then, a lot is happening, but we're not extending the process beyond February 28th for students to make their requests, because again, that whole next step in the process has to start. Um, a quick thing to note, because we'll get into talking about things like math placements and science placements and language placements. And some folks get a little nervous and students will say, you know, I'm, I'm right on the bubble of being able to take one class versus another class. And how do I make that decision right now? So we just want to point out at the very beginning that semester two progress. So the grades that your students are earning in their second semester can absolutely have an impact on potential changes to their course requests. So I'll just give a brief example of what that means. So if your student is in uh, geometry this year and their teacher says, you are gonna be taking Algebra 2 next year. And your student says, well, but I kinda wanna be able to take Algebra 2 trig. What does that look like? And your te that, that teacher might say, great, I'm gonna put that note in that you're interested in that class, and we're gonna see how your semester two progresses. But for right now, I still have to forecast you into the class that matches with your current ability and grades and the requirements that you're meeting. So all that is to say, there is some flexibility. Things might change throughout second semester, um, so we wanna curb some of the anxieties that might exist in thinking about what happens if things change. And then there's always the schedule change process. So students get their schedules in June. Hopefully most of them are excited about what's on that schedule. Um, some things might have changed or some students maybe didn't get the classes that they were hoping for or the elective that they were really hoping for. So every year we go through the process where we uh, give students the option to request a schedule change on their own. And that process happens in August prior to the start of the school year and then into kind of the second week of classes um, once the year starts. So just kind of the big picture and framework of forecasting and schedules. So a few guiding questions as we think about tonight. Um, we are gonna talk with you about how your students think about what courses do they need to first and foremost graduate from Bishop Blanchett? And then what classes do they also need to think about in terms of getting into the colleges that they're interested in? And how there's a lot of overlap, um, thankfully, in those categories, but sometimes there's some decisions that have to be made to help students who are looking at highly selective or competitive schools or specific programs like art or music. So we'll talk about those things. Um, we're also going to help you think about when we talk to your students about prioritizing. So thinking about, I want all these different classes, but I might not be able to take all of them. So how do I prioritize the ones that I want the most and the ones that are going to help me the most in reaching my goals? And then lastly, that physically, how do I forecast? How do I get into the computer and put in my requests and complete this process? So that first question of what courses do students need to graduate? So overview here, I'm gonna pull this out. We, we can't go too far from the computer because we are recording for folks um, who can't be here tonight. So we're a little stuck. But um, in terms of these big kind of credit numbers, um, just know students who take a full schedule with us every year will have more credits than they need to graduate. So this 52 number, um, that is a metric that has been set, but many, many of our students will graduate with more than 52 credits. So they aren't scraping by to earn that total number. But they do have to be mindful of all those different buckets. So English has eight next to it. That means they're gonna complete eight English credits in their time at Bishop Blanchett High School in order to graduate. And that means two a year. So same thing for theology. And then we think about math, there are six required credits, right? So three required years of math. Same thing in social studies, which is our, our history, science, four credits in the language category, so that's two years in the same language, four credits of PE, two credits of art, two in that BT is our business technology, and then a minimum of those six elective credits. So we know that that's a lot to manage. Um, your students are meeting with their counselor more than once a year, most likely and most often, but at a minimum, they're having that forecasting meeting with their counselor every single year. 
where they have looked over their transcript, they're assessing their credits, how far along they are in progressing toward graduation, and helping to keep them right on that path. Um, if you have a student who's a transfer student, um, know that we work with transfer students from so many different high schools, whether that's schools in our area or all across the country or even internationally. So some folks are worried, well, they were in trimesters or quarters or things looked a little bit different. Um, we work with each of those students individually to make sure when we admit them to Bishop Blanchett that we can get them in their time left to the credits that they need to graduate. So a couple specific requirements in terms of just graduation from Blanchett. Um, students are required to take a math or algebra-based science in their senior year. So that means beyond those six required math credits or three years, they are required to take math or algebra-based science in their senior year. Most of our students take that fourth year of math. It is uh, not super often that we are really working with a student to say, okay, are we gonna take that fourth year of math or are we gonna try to squeeze in one of our algebra-based science classes to meet that requirement? But we do like to put that out there for those folks, especially some of our juniors who are maybe struggling in math right now and really not looking forward to adding that fourth year. Um, so we work with our juniors really closely to make sure they're aware of that requirement and meeting that requirement. Um, often a hot topic is the PE waiver. So our students are required to take four credits of PE. Two of those get knocked out freshman year. So they get that PE and health credit for taking a full year of that freshman PE. And then they're required to complete two additional semesters of PE. One of those semesters can be waived by participation in an athletic um, dance activity program in their sophomore or junior year. So that whole process is run through our academic office. Um, students hear announcements about it all the time, especially at the beginning of Blanchett sports seasons. Um, it has to be official. So I had a student ask me when we presented yesterday, well, I play tennis every single day. Can that count as my PE waiver? I said, I love that you're doing that activity, but it has to be an organized program. There has to be a coach or a moderator involved who signs off on your hours. Um, they have to do that in sophomore or junior year. Freshmen cannot waive PE, even if they're doing an activity freshman year. And seniors cannot waive PE. So for our junior parents in this room, for your students, if they have not completed a PE waiver and are not completing that this spring, they cannot use a senior year activity to complete that PE waiver. And just as a reminder, we can only waive one semester, regardless of how many activities they're doing outside of school, how much time that's taking up for them, they still have to complete at least one more PE credit with us in the building. And then in terms of our business tech, so over the last few years, especially those of you who may have older students who've graduated from Blanchett, there were some different business technology classes that met the credit requirements for graduation from Blanchett. But now, officially, everyone in this room, so our, our juniors and below, so junior sophomores and freshmen in our building, they can only meet our business technology requirements in one of the two ways noted. So either they are taking one semester of computer science and one semester of personal finance, doesn't have to be consecutive, doesn't matter the order, but taking both of those classes in their time here, or they are completing a year-long course of one of our AP computer science classes. Now, some students who are really interested in computer science, that is their lane. They might take many of these classes. This might be the elective space where they really dig in and they're taking many of our computer science classes, but they do have to do choose at least one of those options in order to complete that requirement. So beyond just the graduation component, we think about how we're helping students and advising students starting freshman year, right? So as they're choosing their classes, even coming into freshman year, and then as freshman forecasting for sophomore year, we're helping them think about how do I take the classes that I need to in order to get into the colleges that I might be interested in in one, two, three years from now. So this is just a quick glance at current Washington State college entrance requirements. 
And these are minimum requirements that are set for Washington State public colleges and universities. So that means Washington State University, Western Washington University, even the University of Washington, these are minimum baseline requirements for admission to their school. Most of these, if you were to put a little comparison chart side by side, um, are absolutely in line with students meeting graduation requirements from Bishop Blanchett. So that is the good news. Just by going through the process with us, they're forecasting every year, they're choosing the classes for graduation, they are setting themselves up to meet, at a minimum, those basic entrance requirements. A couple notes on here I underlined under science. Um, colleges might require things that we don't necessarily require for graduation. An example would be specifically having students need to take chemistry or physics. There's some programs in colleges that may require calculus or additional years of foreign language. So all of those things certainly exist, but these are those minimum requirements necessary for students to be admissible to public colleges and universities for year colleges and universities in the state of Washington. I think there was a question. Um, the question was, are these subject to change? Um, certainly, year over year, the uh, consortium could decide that they were adjusting those re uh, minimum requirements. We have not seen these change in quite some time. Um, so these are pretty consistent. It's not like it's going to be a big surprise that they're going to say, by the way, now you need, you know, 10, 10 credits of something that when you started high school wasn't applicable to you. Yeah. Um, can kids take four semesters of PE and do the um, court waiver? So the, the question was, um, in terms of that PE waiver for graduation requirements, can students take uh, you know, enough credits, so four credits of, of PE and then use a PE waiver. Um, that's not something the academic office would have them do if they've already completed that PE requirement. Um, you don't get any credit, you don't get a grade for that PE waiver. Um, certainly if a stu student waived a semester of PE and then for some reason really needed to take another PE class, that would just be something they'd talk about with their counselor individually. No, that's a great question, thank you. So the, the question was, because um, the requirement for PE waiver is that that is only available for students to use during their sophomore or junior year here at Blanchett. And the question was, could the activity they participated in be from freshman year? And the answer to that is no. So the, the waiver and the process, the application for that waiver has to happen during the activity that that student is participating in. For example, we've got some athletes upstairs in the building right now. At the start of their basketball season, they would have said, I am applying for a PE waiver, and they'd be able to have their coach sign off at the end of the season that they completed the required number of hours, and then they would get that waiver from the activity they're currently doing, and that would be listed on their current year on their transcript. So if they're waiving it sophomore year, they've got to participate sophomore year. If they're waiving it during junior year, they have to participate in that activity junior year. Yes, so the question was, um, you're kind of having to make assumptions then whether or not am I going to make the team next year? Am I, not, am I going to have that opportunity? Um, certainly that is a, a potential, and that's why we don't allow seniors um, to, to select a PE waiver. So if a junior is like, you know, I, I really want to waive this um, right now in the spring, they need to really get on that because we don't allow that for senior year. We would have to go in and make a schedule change and make sure they were in PE to meet that requirement. Okay, kind of jumping back into some of those college requirements um, and things that go beyond those minimum requirements that we talked about and that coincide with our graduation requirements. There are over 3,000 colleges and universities in the U.S. alone. So we always tell students, when in doubt, look it up. So yes, we can talk about kind of these statewide guidelines and we can talk about things like the public California colleges that give us this additional um, art requirement that they want from students. But there are so many colleges and so many groups out there that want different things. We always tell students, you need to be thinking about colleges you might be interested in, getting on their websites and looking up 
their admissions requirements. Even if they're not sure at this point, I don't even know where, where in the country I'd want to study or the kind of school that I'd be looking for. Just starting to do some research and then asking their counselor when they come in to meet and having those conversations, they can start to learn more about, hey, if I want the possibility of going to a public California college or university, how do I do that? And we'll say, let's meet our graduation requirements and be mindful that the biggest difference is that those public colleges in California require two credits of art in the same discipline. So Blanchett, for example, we say take two art credits. That could be one semester of band and one semester of theater, or it could be drawing and photography. But those public California colleges say we are requiring two credits of art in the same discipline, so a year of choir, a year of band, a year of theater, a year of fine art or performing art. So we help your students identify which classes will meet their need and also hopefully help them um, you know, get involved in something that they're interested in. But that's just an example that there are requirements for different schools that we have to be mindful of as we go through this process and help your students choose classes that are gonna open doors for them and not limit any opportunities in the future. So a couple other notes. Um, grades below a 2.0. They may or may not meet minimum requirements for colleges. And that's in core academic classes. So for example, if your student receives a 1.7 in their English 9 class, there are some colleges and universities that will say, we do not assess a grade under a 2.0 to have met our minimum requirements. So that can mean that your student would, have, would need to retake or do credit recovery, some type of class, to retake that English 9 class to get above a 2.0 to meet that requirement for colleges. So our office and the academic office, we send out uh, communications to students and parents when students earn under a 2.0 in those core academic classes because we want them to have as much time as possible to potentially retake that class, earn a higher grade, and not be in jeopardy of being in a situation where a college comes back and says, you are not admissible because you're not meeting those minimum requirements in those core academic subjects. Okay, so as we think about those college requirements, sometimes we also have to go to kind of the far end of the spectrum of thinking about highly selective colleges, really competitive schools in terms of admission. And the biggest thing is starting by exceeding minimum requirements. So for example, that's four years of math, four years of science, potentially three years or more of a foreign language, or additional areas of focus in other core subjects. So for example, that could be for students really interested in STEM, maybe they're really you know, taking all of our AP computer science classes, they're really focusing on that additional year of math, maybe it's calculus, maybe they're adding statistic as their elective. So really trying to bulk up for those competitive and selective colleges in a way that helps them show they've maximized opportunities that were available to them. So all different high schools across the country offer different versions of AP curriculum, IB curriculum, all these different things. But what the colleges are looking for is how did the students at this school maximize the opportunities at their particular school? So that has us thinking with your students about how do I think about which honors and AP classes might be the right fit for me? to demonstrate that I'm challenging myself, that I'm working hard, that I'm working towards that you know, really strong rigor of curriculum. And you know, the answer is there's no right number. So there's no right combination of honors and AP classes that will put your student in the absolute best position um, for admission at competitive schools. But what we can do is think on an individual level, so working with each of your students to think about what are my strongest areas? How can I continue to challenge myself in the course core categories where I've done really well? So for example, that means if I took English 9 honors and English 10 honors, it would be a really good decision for me to think about taking that next level of English, which would be AP. Even if it's gonna be challenging, it might be in their best interest to continue on and take that AP class in that subject area 
instead of maybe adding a more challenging class in a different subject area. So that's really important. Um, thinking about GPA requirements for our AP courses helps your student also consider what's gonna be the right fit for them. Right? They might be going through this process and thinking, oh, I really gotta get myself in gear. I wanna take some more challenging courses. And we wanna help cultivate that with them if that's the right fit, but we also have to make sure they're meeting the GPA requirements set by Bishop Blanchett in order to take those courses. All of that is very transparent and in our course catalog. So any class that has a GPA or prerequisite requirement, it will be listed there. So as we're thinking about that idea of rigor, of curriculum, and balance in their schedule, um, we also recognize, and the colleges recognize, your students are more than just an academic grade factory, right? They are human beings, they have interests, they have involvement, they have challenges. So while the academic piece is just one piece of your student and of the puzzle and of this sort of package of their future college application, it is arguably the most important part of that college admissions, that selective college admission process, which is one of the reasons why we focus so intently on it during the forecasting process. So we help your students make educated and informed choices that are gonna help set them up for success. Okay, and with these fun graphics, I'm gonna pass it over to us. All right, I'm back. Um, so just, uh, we're gonna transition here, and as I do that, we're gonna um, just to plug a couple of books that I always like to talk about. Um, one is, um, if you've got uh, uh, one of your, your students looking at um, going off to college in a couple years here, um, I really like the Naked Roommate series, if you're thinking about books. Uh, these have been around for a while. Uh, there's a parent version. There's uh, there's an updated version uh, of this book. Um, that's just it's it's got a, some fun twists on uh, kind of what what it means to go to college. Um, they've they've updated it for the uh, 2020s. Um, it was this was around in the mid 2000s, and the landscape has changed. Um, but uh, it's a great book series if you're interested in something like that. And then I think for everybody, um, I've been talking about the How to Raise an Adult book for a while. Um, it's a really great down-to-earth, uh, reality-based, um, very applicable uh, conversation about um, how to raise an adult. Like what sort of things should you be thinking about as parents as you are bringing your young person and sending them off into into the world. So uh, some great books just to kind of take a little shift, shift the gears here a little bit. Um, so now we're going to talk about picking the classes that you want to take, right, or that your students want to take. So how are they going to do that? What do we want them to be thinking about? How are they actually going to go through this process? Um, so we have all the things we've been talking about that, that Katie was talking about. We've got graduation progress. We've got goals for college. We've got how are you going to challenge yourself, like what maybe places where you're going to stretch yourself a little bit, take harder classes, take an extra year of a language, take a little bit of a harder math class. Um, and then how are we going to find that balance? Okay, Because I think from our perspective, and I'm sure from yours too, we don't want our students to be overwhelmed. right? You don't want your student to have too much work on their plate, right? Obviously. Um, it doesn't help them. doesn't help um, you it doesn't help their teachers like we want them to have something that's manageable but that's gonna look different for everybody so um, uh, when uh, I'll kind of give you a, a, a little bit of an insight into what we're gonna be talking with your students about when we meet for their one-on-one -on -one forecasting meetings um, the questions that I ask are you know not just how did first semester go or how is school going or like let's talk about your grades it's how was your workload did you get overwhelmed did you feel like you had too much on your plate in the first semester and for some students they say you know no it was pretty manageable i was able to balance you know my activities maybe I had a job did a sport um and i spent you know an hour or two on schoolwork a night and maybe i got busy a couple of times in the semester but it was pretty manageable i said okay great right maybe you're somebody that can handle a little bit of a harder course load right we can help them navigate that okay should you take if you're taking an honors and AP class right now, should you take another one? Should you keep it kind of the same? So that's where we try to help them find that balance and get that dial set, you know, at a level that's good for them, right? Um, we do have students who are, you know, maybe in their juniors this year and going into their senior year, we need to kind of dial it down a little bit because we want to make sure that they're not 
overwhelmed, right? And maybe they had a really, really hard junior year and we kind of figured that out, right? Maybe sophomore year, that's kind of the way they're looking. Sophomore to junior year can be a little tricky just because there's a big jump into junior year and there's a lot more opportunities for AP courses and for honors courses. So we want to make sure that they're not overstretching themselves. So that's part of that conversation that we're having with them in that, those one-on-one -on -one meetings. But, but if you guys have those conversations with them first and say, hey, how's it going? Like, how did you feel stressed? Did you feel overwhelmed? Do we need to uh, make sure that we find that balance in your schedule? So that's kind of how all of this is kind of coming together. Sometimes these, uh, sometimes these goals are in conflict, right? I've had students who have said, I have really high goals for college and I wanna take the hardest possible classes that we offer here might not be a great idea. So we have that conversation with them and make sure that they're on the right track and achieving at the level that, that's right for them. Um, one thing I want to talk about is the weighted GPA. So we added this this year. Uh, just want to kind of set everybody kind of in, in the same place for this. Um, all this is is an additional uh, component to the transcript uh, where we are adding a weight to honors classes of a 0.5 and AP and UW in the high school courses of a 1.0, meaning that if a student gets a, uh, let's say hypothetically, a, um, they're in um, AP language and composition junior year, and they get a 3.3, okay? So on the transcript, it's gonna say 3.3, lang AP language and composition, 3.3, first semester. Uh, when we calculate a cumulative weighted GPA, that is going to have a 1.0 added to it, so it'll be f averaged in as a 4.3. Okay, does that make sense? Um, and so we'll do that for all of their classes. So in the transcript, it's not, their, their grade in the class isn't going to change. A college is gonna see this, they're gonna see this, you're gonna see this on the transcript. Um, but when they actually see the GPA, they'll have a, an unweighted GPA and a weighted GPA. So that is, I mean, we've, we're kind of going through our first admission cycle with this weighted GPA. Uh, we've gotten great feedback from colleges. I think that it's, looking really good in terms of how um, that's benefited our students in the admissions process and in the scholarship application process. Um, one of the things that we're, I don't know, maybe a little mindful of, I don't know if I'm worried about it, but I'm mindful of it is, um, you know, is this going to give students uh, uh, like pressure to take harder classes? And I think that's, that's something we're kind of pay attention to. Um, from our perspective as school counselors, we're not changing our advising based on this like we want our students to continue to take appropriately challenging courses balance challenged but but a kind of a balanced challenge um so that's kind of a, i think just i wanted to put that out there kind of be be uh transparent about how this is going how this is looking um hopefully students aren't feeling too much of a, a pressure i think if anything what we're hoping is that um, it's going to take some of the pressure off because very often we have these conversations with students who are doing very well academically, but they are feeling maybe a little protective of a higher GPA, right? And that sometimes happens. And we want students, again, to be appropriately challenged. And so feel okay to take something that might be a little bit harder, again, appropriately, right? Um, was there a question out there? Just a hand. Okay, maybe not. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we are with, with the weighted GPA right now. Uh, and as we're kind of thinking about that in terms of, of picking classes. Uh, okay, so how to forecast for classes. So this is, this is sort of the timeline. I'm gonna talk through the timeline here. Um, so we had uh, CP with them yesterday. We had a big uh, meeting. They asked some great questions, uh, gave them all of their instructions. So they have, hopefully you, you um, got their uh, uh, handouts when they brought them home. We also sent an email uh, to uh, all of our freshmen because they're the first group that we're meeting with, with the same handouts that they got yesterday. So if they lost them already, if you're a freshman, they got an email from their counselor with those handouts in electronic form. So they have those. Um, if they missed for whatever reason yesterday, uh, they just need to come down to the academic office or just come to the meeting. That's fine, just they don't need to have their stuff with them necessarily. We'd like them to, but they don't have to have it. So that's where the handout, they got the handouts yesterday. They came home with those, hopefully. Um, they are going to have had or will be having conversations with their teachers about their subject area classes. So English teachers are talking about what are their options for next year, what should they consider in that subject area. Math teachers are making placements for math already. So math placements are all going to be in Skyward 
already. Math teachers just put those in. They are, to a certain extent, negotiable. I mean, they, I think for the most part, they're, they're you know, fairly well set. Um, teachers, if a student's kind of on the bubble, they have a conversation with the student about kind of where we're leaning right now. And as Katie said, maybe things change in second semester. So having those conversations with teachers, those are ongoing right now. Uh, hopefully they're having conversations with parents and guardians so that you guys are all on the same page. And then they're gonna talk to us. And at that point, they're going to um, get into Skyward and put their requests in on Skyward. So they have instructions for that as well. So the meetings with us are freshmen this week. Um, sophomores are going to be the start of next week. Juniors are going to be the end of next week. Uh, we're just going back to back to back to back. Okay, just running through the day. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, so they'll get their time in, the, in an email uh, with their instructions for what to, to bring. Uh, these are the materials that were, uh, that were given to them just to kind of tell you what they look like. So the forecasting worksheet has all of the classes that they are eligible for at their grade level. So that's the forecasting worksheet. It's got the course numbers. It's got the uh, what, what courses are in which subject area, sorted by what is required versus what are electives. Um, the course catalog has all of the detail that you're ever going to want to know about a course, um, at least from the kind of the, the overview uh, perspective. It also has course flows. So I think this is one of the, the things that um, some, some folks uh, sometimes have some questions about is like, okay, if I'm starting here in math, what's next and what's after that and what's after that? Or in science, like what does the science uh, flow look like? Um, that's all in the course catalog. It's on the website right now. You can go to the academic page and it's going to be on their sidebar. Uh, you can, you can uh, download the PDF uh, as we're talking about it right now. The course pa planning form, uh, I'll talk about that here in a second, but this is where they're going to start to write down the courses that they're going to actually forecast for. It's a really great way for them to organize everything so they can kind of count up to make sure that they've got all the credits they need. Um, and so they, they kind of use that to write that down. And then their direction sheet is just the written out directions of what they need to be doing and um, uh, when they need to do it by. So those are the handouts that they came home with yesterday. Um, I'm going to kind of, I'm not going to go through these sheets in detail. I just want to kind of point out some things here. So this is an example of what the core section of the sophomore forecasting worksheet looks like. So it's got the number of credits, the course number, course title. Um, so sophomores are picking between two English or an English 10 and an honors English 10, uh, world history and AP world history. Those are all the math courses they're eligible for and then the language courses. So this, again, kind of helps lay out for them what all of the options are. Um, and so this is going to look different for juniors. It's going to look different for, uh, or for sophomore forecasting, for junior forecasting, for senior year forecasting. Uh, and then the electives are going to look a little bit different. You'll notice the electives, uh, most of those electives are one credit electives, meaning they're one semester. Uh, if it's two credits, that means it's a full year course. Uh, so that does make a, a difference in a lot of situations, uh, whether or not students picking, um, uh, they just want a one semester or a full year course. A couple notes on that. Uh, we don't know what is being offered which semester. So sometimes students will come in and they'll come to our meeting and I'll say, I want to take uh, computer science first semester and I'm going to take woodworking second semester. I said, it's not how it works. Um, you are going to make those selections and then Skyward is going to put you into what is available based on your, uh, the rest of your schedule and, and when things are uh, placed into the schedule. So um, those are the um, kind of the, the kind of ins and outs of, of what that looks like. Um, there's just note the zero period classes are on there as well. So if they're looking at those, that's, that's something to kind of keep in mind. Um, and if you're having, adding a zero period, you're not going to take 14 credits, you're going to take 16 credits. Um, so I'm going to talk about the course planning form here for a second. So um, this is, again, just to keep you organized, make sure that you've got everything in the right category and you're picking the right classes. A um, couple of notes on alternates. So this is kind of where we get into the um, kind of how students need to be thinking about the courses they're actually requesting. So what they're going to do is they're going to request their, basically make requests for their top choices for their 14 credits that they're taking next year. And then they're going to need to select backups for those, and those are our alternates. And if they don't put any alternates into Skyward, they're just going to get what they get. Um, and we can see, you know, if like they come in in August and they say, I didn't get my top choices, and I'm going to look to see whether or not they got their alternates, and if they didn't put any alternates in, they're going to kind of get what they get. Uh, so please, we we're telling them you got to put in alternates. They do need to be prepared to take their alternates. Those are still classes they're committing to take. Uh, so again, as we're kind of 
going through the schedule change process in the fall uh, before school starts. Sometimes students say, hey, I got an alternate. I'm going to say, yeah, that, that works. That's how, that's how it works. Uh, sometimes you get your alternates. Uh, and and mo a lot of the time, we still try to see if we can get them in their first choice classes, uh, especially if, other, if they have a really compelling reason. So again, making sure that they've got alternates, we really emphasize that with them. Senior year, they have uh, choices for theology electives. So they have to take two credits of theology senior year. There are four options for one semester classes. They're going to pick their top two choices, and then they're going to pick two backups, and they're going to rank those two in order. So they kind of have to be prepared to pick or to take any of the senior theology electives, but we do give them a chance to rank their top two and then put their other two in, in as alternates. Um, same thing with senior social studies courses. So senior social studies, you either take um, AP American government and you take that for the full year, or you take one semester of American government and one of our other uh, two, we're down to two right now, two social studies electives, right? So either, um, U.S. after 45 or racial and ethnic America, and the other ones are alternate. So um, again, this is all written out in their instructions, but just to kind of give you an example of what that's going to look like. So they're going to use this, fill it out. Um, if they can have this uh, filled out as completely as possible by the time they meet with their counselor, that would be real swell. It's going to make that meeting a lot more efficient. Um, if there are questions, so if you guys are sitting there at home and you're thinking, OK, here are the questions that, that we have. Just write them on the forecasting worksheet. And when they bring it in to meet with us, we can go over their questions and make sure that they have everything down. Uh, so that's a kind of a great place to use that as well. This isn't going to get turned in. It's not due at any point. Um, so it's just a way for, for uh, your student and you to track like what, what are they actually picking. OK, so some things to think about. Course catalog, we mentioned that. You've got to make sure you read it. Uh, the, the pertinent information about picking classes is in there. Things like prerequisites or recommended GPAs are in there. Um, especially when we get into higher levels of like science, for example, that's where prerequisites come into play a little bit more in terms of what you actually have to take in order to take certain science courses. Um, but if there's any kind of questions about those, or if we're thinking about whether or not to take an honors class or an AP class, that's where you're going to find uh, kind of the recommended GPAs and the prerequisites. Um, making sure that students are talking to teachers in those subject areas about classes in their subject. So a lot of the time when a student comes in to meet with us and they say, I really don't know whether or not I should take AP US history or regular US history. And I might say, have you talked to your world history teacher about that, right? Is this a conversation that you've had? Because they're an expert in their subject area. They have, they have department meetings. They, even if they don't teach US history, they know about it. So they can give some guidance on whether or not they're going to be a good candidate for that class. Um, I think especially when we get into selecting whether or not to take a third year of a language, I think, so if you have a sophomore or a junior who's in a level two language, they're thinking about whether or not to take that level three language, that's a great conversation to have with their language teacher, right? After school, before school, passing period, after class, like something like that, just have that conversation with, with their teacher. So uh, a couple of things um, just about the rigor, like students are maybe taking like higher levels of rigor in terms of honors and AP courses. Um, and, and kind of going back to the benchmarks that we're, we're sort of thinking about and, and we're having those conversations. So when we're kind of up above three honors and AP courses, that's when, when they're meeting with their counselor, we're going to really make sure that we're you know, good with them taking that level of rigor, right? So that's kind of where, you know, not that it's a red flag necessarily, usually it's a, a good thing that they want to take those classes, but we really make sure that they're not getting themselves in over their heads. Um, so that's kind of where we're, you know, um, I, I wouldn't say we're drawing a line, but that's kind of one of the one of the benchmarks that we're looking at. Is like, okay, we're over three here. Maybe that's fine, but you know, we might need to have a conversation about that and finding again balance. Um, a note about honors and AP classes, because this is kind of where we get into, you know, we kind of ambition meets reality. Um, a lot of students might say, I really want to take this AP class really kind of maybe on the bubble for it, and I'm not really sure if I'm going to be able to handle it. And then they sign up for it, which might be a good thing to do, right? I'm going to commit to it. I'm going to sign up for it. And then we get to August, and it's, they had a great summer, a lot of relaxation, a lot of, you know, a lot of Netflix, a lot of sports, a lot of travel. And they start looking at the uh, summer reading for, you know, uh, AP Lang and Comp, 
And like, I didn't do a whole lot of that. Um, I should probably email my counselor and get out of AP Lang and Comp. Ooh, God, no. Okay. Um, it's hard, right? It's tough because we are kind of going, again, going back to the sort of the big picture here, we're creating a schedule for students, right? We're creating a schedule based on what they request. And if we have, maybe we can handle one student that can't take that AP class they signed up for, but we can't move everybody out of there, right? We start to run into uh, the limitations of our scheduling system. So uh, just kind of something to, as you're having this conversation with your students, as we're having that conversation with your students, um, we want to make sure that they know they're making a commitment to take these classes, whether they're electives or AP classes, um, and we want to make sure that they're, they kind of understand what that means uh, when, when they're signing up. So it, gets, it does get hard to drop AP classes as we get closer to the start of the year. It just, it really does because classes get really full. We have a fairly tight schedule just overall and we wanna make sure that you're, um, you know, we're, we're again, like have a, a reality check when it comes to, to, to those things. And again, we just want, uh, above all, we wanna make sure the students are taking and choosing classes that are appropriate for them. Um, you'll notice on here, this is a slide we showed to your students. We said, hey, talk to your parents about this. So again, like telling you, we told them, we told you, um, that everybody needs to be on the same page. Um, a long time ago, we used to have a uh, signature that was required, like parents would actually have to sign off on their forecasting sheet. Were you here when we did that? Oh yeah, that was fun. Um, and we'd have to like send forecasting sheets back that didn't have parent signatures on it. And it was, you know, kind of a, added a lot of hoops for the kids to jump through. And for you guys, frankly, as parents or the previous generation of parents. Um, so we, we kind of went away from that, mostly because we moved to this to Skyward system, which didn't really lend itself to, to that kind of paperwork. Um, but we're just kind of saying like, you know, we know you as, as parent and parent and guardian community are very involved in what your students are doing. And I'm sure that you're going to be checking in on them on their schedule, right? And so if something happens where they manage to sign up for classes where, you know, uh, parents missed what they signed up for, you know, that's, so I don't think that has really ever happened, but you know, it's like it, we'll have a conversation about it if, if we do. Um, but we do want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Everyone kind of has the same understanding of uh, what the student's picking and, and whether or not that's the, the right spot for them. Um, and then uh, one of the last things, uh, just to kind of reiterate here, um, for especially for when we're thinking about um, sophomores going into junior year and juniors especially going into senior year, uh, your application and what you're picking uh, is part of your application to college. Like your, sorry, your, your schedule and the courses you're picking are part of your application to college. So colleges are looking at grades in core courses first and foremost, that's the most important thing they're looking at. But then they're looking at the overall, like what did the student take in, in high school? Um, and junior year, they're going to have those courses and then grades, but when they're applying as seniors, they're going to have all of their grades through the end of junior year, and then all their colleges are gonna see are the courses the students selected in their senior year. Sometimes they're gonna use first semester senior year grades as part of that application review, but for quite a few of them, they're just seeing those senior year classes. So that's kind of a significant piece of the puzzle. So we wanna make sure that their students are mindful of that, and again, especially juniors going into senior year. Yes, please. So the yeah 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 so so uh, the 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 question comment um, up here was uh, so so the student is take, currently taking two AP classes and maybe in a conversation with their counselor said hey let's or I think that might have even been part of our presentation if you're taking let's say two AP classes as a junior you should probably think about continuing that along because again that's part of your application to college now that's generally you know kind of what we'd like to see right if a student's doing well we'd like to see them maintain that level of rigor in their schedule again assuming that everything's working for them and it's balanced and you know they're not getting overwhelmed or they're not you know uh, overworked or too busy so we would like to you know i think that's sort of the benchmark that we would have i think that's what colleges would want to see that the continue if a, a student's maintained a good level of academic success at a certain level of rigor that they continue that in their senior year so that's that's kind of what that where that comment came from. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, okay. So council meetings. These are what's coming up. Uh, again, 
Freshmen, we're starting hot tomorrow morning at 940. We've got the first batch coming in. Uh, we're going to be meeting with freshmen this week, sophomores next week, juniors end of next week. Uh, they're going to get their appointment via email. Uh, they'll see their time for their meeting. Um, when it's their meeting time, they're going to stand up from their desk. They're going to walk to the counseling center. They're going to sit down with their counselor. They're going to have a conversation. And that might take 10 minutes, maybe it'll take a little bit longer. Usually we, you know, we, we get it to a good place in 10 minutes. Um, they'll bring in their planning worksheet, uh, their, their planning form, their worksheet, questions they have, and we're just gonna kind of get into it with them and see how far we get. Um, once they have that meeting, they're gonna get into Skyward and put their requests in on Skyward using the instructions they got from, uh, in, in writing from the academic office and we're gonna email them a reminder about those as well. If we need to have more conversation, we definitely can. So this is, I, some people say, well, can you really do all of this in 10 minutes? I mean, most of the time, yeah, actually. Like, by the time you guys talk to them, by the time their teachers talk to them, by the time they've gotten the instructions, the first level of instructions from us, I'd say like 95% of students are gonna know what they need to take, right? And so then they come and meet with us and they say, this is what I'm taking, I have these questions, we talk about it, good to go, right? There are some that are gonna continue along. So if that's your student, um, maybe there's some questions after the fact, uh, they might come back in, right? Again, we're doing this all the way through the end of February. So there's gonna be some continued conversations with some of you, you and some of your students. Totally fine. Um, I would say, you know, will, um, students might initiate that. They might send us an email and say, hey, Mr. Russell, can I come back in and check in with you? We still got questions on our end or my end about what I'm taking. Awesome, we can do that. Um, but if, if they get back and you know you guys are talking about this in a couple weeks, and you're like, ah, I'm not sure about you know Spanish three, right? Let's have that have them come back in. We'll we'll keep talking about it. So um, for some students, this is an ongoing conversation. For some students, we're talking about this all the way through the end of the school year, right? We're going to come back to things that we need to because things are changing one way or the other. Maybe they're doing a lot better second semester than they were first semester. Maybe some things aren't going so hot second semester. We might need to make some adjustments. Again, this is an ongoing conversation um, with, with you guys and with your students and your students with us. Okay, entering requests on Skyward. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, mostly because it's all, uh, it's in writing. It's on um, uh, the, the um, in, the, in the handouts that your students got, and it's writing's too small to really do well in a presentation. But anyway, they're gonna get into Skyward, they're gonna click on their uh, schedule. Uh, once we turn it on, they will be able to go in to uh, enter their requests. Um, it's a little tricky, but I would say, again, most students do just fine getting their, uh, getting their requests into Skyward. I, and I say tricky because Skyward, as you guys can tell, uh, looks like it was designed in like, you know, 2005 and hasn't been updated and that's because that's true. Um, so I, rumors are that they're coming out with a new version where we're gonna see what happens. Um, anyway, once they get in there, they'll be able to put their courses in. It'll make sense. Again, make sure, like if you're helping them with this, make sure they get their alternates in. Um, so uh, just a couple, I got one more thing, a couple of reminders. Um, and we're just gonna open it up to questions for, for whatever time we have left. Um, and we're, we're great on time. Um, so uh, we met with them on February 6th. Uh, we're meeting with the freshmen, so I think we actually, did we do that? Oh, enrollment contracts. They wanted me to remind you guys about this. March 3rd, I believe, is the deadline for re-enrollment at the business office. I believe they, they have all the information on their end about that. Um, and then later in the spring, we've kind of mentioned this a couple of times, there may be some changes to placements, so especially with math or with language um, or, or with honors and AP courses, uh, we may be making changes to placements in later in the spring. And then again, the actual schedule with uh, room numbers, uh, class periods, teachers' names, all those fun things are coming out in late June, uh, and that's when they, they'll actually see what they, what they get, which is very exciting. Um, I think we talked through that stuff. Okay, final thing before questions, and we'll kind of leave it on this slide. A um, couple of reminders here. Junior families, we have college kickoff night coming up. This is for juniors and their families, so parents and guardians are welcome to come to this evening, February 28th. Um, we're gonna start upstairs in the main gym. 
and then we're going to have a bunch of breakout sessions. We have college um, uh, admissions reps coming in to talk. We have other college counseling experts coming in to lead sessions. So there's a lot going on that evening. Uh, but for juniors and their families, this is a great day to come in and get a lot of information on uh, college applications, the admissions process, all of those updates. Um, and then once we get through that, uh, the counselors are going to shift to meeting with juniors and their families. And what we did last year, and we're gonna continue along with this, is juniors will meet with us in the counseling center, and then we're gonna have the uh, parent, at least one parent, hopefully parent or guardian, uh, maybe, maybe um, both or whoever, whoever, whoever's in that group, um, meet via Zoom um, with, with all of us together um, and get everybody on the same page, talk about planning for what they're looking for for college, what they've done so far, what they need to do, making sure that they're really set up for finishing the year strong, going into summer, and be ready to hit the ground running senior year. So we've got a lot of information to share. We do that individually with students and families from March all the way through the end of the school year. Uh, a couple other things, Mac Fun is coming up. Um, this is a great night for the whole community to come together. Um, keep an eye out for the date on that, but I always like plugging that. It's a terrific evening program. Uh, a lot of food, a lot of fun activities for, for everybody. Um, that's our Multicultural Affairs Council um, that puts that evening together with a lot of family help, uh, which is great. And then I always love plugging this for uh, Ms. Valenzuela Cardin, our um, international uh, program director. We're always looking for host families. So if you or uh, like one of your, like uh, maybe, maybe your brother or sister-in-law have uh, a space in their home that they wanna host one of our international students, um, or a friend of yours, or it doesn't, they don't have to be a Blanchett parent. Um, but if you know somebody that would be interested, have them reach out to Miss Valenzuela Cardin um, and, and uh, get, get some information about that. That's a really, really great opportunity for families uh, to, to host one of our fantastic international students who are really cool folks. So um, with that, I'm gonna open it up to questions. Uh, Katie's got a mic. Uh, we'll try to make sure that we, we cover as much as we can. We'll probably, we'll see kind of how we go here for the next like 10, 15 minutes. But um, what questions do you guys have? Yeah. Have freshman students received this template slot with their counselor Yeah, so the question is, have, have the freshmen gotten their scheduled time with their counselor? Yes, they got that yesterday. Okay. So they just need to check their email. Okay. Um, and they'll have, it's, it's a, a PDF attachment. They just open that up, find their name, find their time on the date that they're coming in and they just show up. If they miss it, that's fine. If they have a test, just come down after the test. So I have, I've already gotten emails from freshmen who have said, Mr. Russell, I can't come because I've got a test. And I say, don't worry about it. Just come down when you're done. It's not that formal. Uh, you're gonna be fine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure, so schedule, like you're asking about like the schedule like change they process. The schedule, they don't like their classes. When we looked, it said you need a very compelling reason like you're not gonna be able to get any of the college of your choice because of this. Yeah. But it sounded like today, if the kid was really unhappy with their schedule, there might be something to do. Oh, oh God, okay, well I guess I gotta thread that needle. Um, yeah, so the question's about um, if a student, so if, once a student gets their schedule, what happens with, uh, how do we get that schedule changed? Um, and so we have some, we have a, so we, we, it's a big part of our, um, the kind of the fall before, like in August before school starts and in um, January, December and January before the second semester. So we kind of, we do wanna make sure that students are, they do have good reasons for changing. Um, so the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the instructions that we give them when they actually go to change their, the, to make a schedule change request say, uh, they need to be a compelling reason to change, right? So if they made the request for the class, or if they put it as an alternate, and they just don't really like that class, that's not, we don't really consider that a compelling reason because we do want them to take the courses they actually asked for and they signed up for, right? So that's, we, we do kind of say that's not really a compelling reason. So compelling reasons would be um, meeting graduation requirements, meeting um, the uh, like college entrance requirements, um, if they have specific things that they were trying to take for compelling reasons, 
but they have a chance to tell us what those are too. So if a student does get a schedule and they're like, I don't really think I should have this schedule, and they have a reason to say like, hey, I, I don't think I should have the, this class, they can put that in writing and we'll, we'll have a, we will always have a conversation with them about it. So it's never gonna be like a, uh, well, I guess sometimes they, they are no's, but um, we'll definitely talk to them about it. So I guess that's the, the threading the needle on that, yeah. yeah yes? I, I have a question about that PE with the labor. Yes. So let's say my daughter is in 10th grade. She's playing on the soccer team. That hmm. counts as one credit waiver. And then in junior year, if she gets on the soccer team again, would that be a second credit okay. waiver? So uh, the, uh, just to reiterate the PE waiver. So there's a question about the PE waiver. You can do one semester of uh, waived PE. So you have four credits of PE you need to take to graduate. Two of those are done freshman year. Uh, you can, one of those, so not, you can only do one sport for one semester can be waived and then you'll have to take the other semester of PE at Blanchett to graduate. Does that make sense? Sophomore year waived, junior year back to PE. Uh, so theoretically, yeah. I, I, so uh, uh, one thing I would say about PE, just to kind of throw this out there, right, if we're still here and thinking about this, um, one thing we do, I would say, like, you know, if all else being equal, um, I, I would say if, if a student's not really sure about PE, sophomore year is a great time to take PE. Uh, it, we're adding a academic course sophomore year in world history, so they're going from five academic courses to really like six. Um, so that's where having an extra a class with no homework is a really great thing, and keeping them active and like you know, it's a, a sophomore year PE is team sports. So it's a lot of fun, usually. Yeah, yeah. This is a lot of other oh, so, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, Just a, a note about that PE waiver. It's meant to be a part of our schedule to help students who already have a really packed schedule take all of the classes that they need to graduate. So most of our students take two semesters of PE on freshman year. But there's a lot of students who are like, I can't fit it all in. I can't get my computer science and my art, and I want to take choir, and I want to take AB environmental science, and I'm having trouble making sure I get all those requirements in. That PE waiver is really there to help make sure those students get all those opportunities to take the academic classes that they're really interested in. It's not one that we have to worry too much about for too many students. Oh, yeah, hey, great question. Um, yeah. And my son will be going into the sophomore year mm -hmm. without the English language. Yeah. How do we decide which one's going to the one that really drips the difference on the English? Great question. So, the, the question that was asked is about. Um, our, well, actually, there's two parts of that. One is uh, we have a conversational Spanish class. So we have a conversational Spanish program uh, that's different from our uh, regular Spanish program. So conversational Spanish is two years. Uh, so you cannot, there's no, there's no way to move from conversational Spanish two into a higher level Spanish. Um, so it's, I, we call it like a terminal two year, but it meets your college entrance requirements. Colleges have no problem with it. They see it's college prep. It's a great, it's a great Spanish class, right? But it's uh, conversational Spanish is designed for students, really, and I say designed very specifically for students who have um, specific learning needs. They don't have to have a learning plan with us necessarily, but that's part of it. So if they have a, they're on a learning plan or they have a um, a specific learning diagnosis, that would be a reason to take conversational Spanish, right? But if there's another reason, we'll definitely have that conversation with the student uh, or if, if um, you know, with, with parent um, about whether or not conversational Spanish might be the right fit for that student. So uh, for example, this year we have uh, like 24 students in conversational Spanish. That's, yeah, so it's, it's not a huge program, but it is there and it serves a really great need for students who are, um, you know, have that specific learning need. Um, so the, the other question, though, is about uh, whether or not students who are not currently in a language, or not whether or not, but like what should they be thinking about when they're picking their language for next year, right? So that's, but that, I would say that's a very individual question. Um, that's one of the things that we're going to be talking with your student about when we meet with them one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So we're going to see, okay, this is a student who's not currently in a language for, you know, whatever reason. There's a lot of reasons students didn't start, start in a language freshman year. Um, and then we'll talk to them about what would be the right fit for them, what the, where their interests are, where they are academically. Um, maybe it'll be conversational Spanish. Maybe it'll be, uh, you know, French one, right? Um, German one, uh, whatever, whatever it is that they are, have an interest in. So we'll have that conversation with the student. Yeah. And Go for any sort of biology, one versus fundamentals of biology, is that 
and then the other, so the other question is about, um, I think the like uh, chemistry, because everyone's in biology right now. So sophomore year, everyone's going to be moving from biology to chemistry, and we have a chemistry foundations course, and that is a course designed for students who are in uh, going to be going into geometry foundations. So chemistry foundations has less math in it. Uh, so if your student isn't at a uh, high enough level of math, right, they're going to be in a chemistry class that's going to be conducive to that, right? So we're not going to put them in a chemistry class where they're doing more math than they have learned so far, okay? But those, I would say, sorry, I, I think maybe we didn't mention this. Chemistry placement is going to be made by the biology teacher. So that will already be in Skyward. So if you're, student, if you're kind of wondering whether or not your student should take chem foundations or regular chem, that'll be in Skyward already. They're just going to have it. If they have any questions about that, they can talk with their counselor about it. Um, and the math placement is going to be in Skyward already. And the if they're in a language, level one language, the level two language will automatically be in uh, Skyward as well. But again, if they have any questions about that or something needs to change, then we're going to talk to them about it. So I was, the question's about um, when I was talking about like three or more honors or AP courses. It's not that we don't want them taking more than that. It's just if they are planning on taking more than that, we're really going to interrogate it and make sure that that's the right call. Because you get up to, we do have students who are taking like five AP classes, which I know, right? Just like, whew, all right, everyone take a breath. It's not you. You don't have to do that. Um, the ones that are, are doing well because they are well prepared. Right? We don't, I mean, I don't think we have anybody in that level who's like in over their heads because we have these conversations and make sure they're right, taking the right courses. We have some students who would have liked to be in five AP classes and we talk them away and just like, we're gonna take a more appropriate course. So that's the, again, that's part of that. So when do we, once we get up to like three or more, we're like, okay, let's really make sure we're all on the same page here. Make sure that you're taking classes you should be taking. Great question. So um, that was clarification on that senior year math or algebra-based science requirement. Um, statistics actually does not meet that does requirement. Meet the math requirement? Um, so if your student is deciding about statistics, we will work with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, typically, if they're taking statistics, they have already taken pre-calculus. Oh, and if you're right, taking yeah. pre-calculus, you are actually exempt from that requirement. So there's a lot of ways that students get there. Um, so that's why. Yeah. Yes, they can take statistics yes. as long as they take a pre calculus and then they're already met that requirement. Sorry, that's me. you might want to think about taking maybe your business classes or PE, you know what I mean? So that, that's part of that conversation we're having is like, okay, you took your art, but now we might need to think about taking our business tech classes or maybe take one of your PE classes uh, so we can start to chip away at some of these other things. Now, some students kind of thinking about arts and like theater for, for ex as another example where students are like really invested in theater and they want to keep taking theater classes. Um, that's kind of where we do, we, and, and we didn't emphasize this too much, but in the course catalog, there is a four-year course planning form that is a fantastic tool to fill out if you guys are thinking about how are we going to fit all of this stuff in, because it really lays out, okay, this is, these are the required courses every year. 
these are um, kind of the areas where you might need to pick an elective, right? And how are you, and if you start filling this out and adding up credits, how are you gonna fit in if you wanna take, it's kind of hard to take choir every year and get the rest of your stuff in. So you have to kind of think about where, where are you gonna take theater, where are you gonna take choir, where are you gonna take business tech, right? And fit in the rest of your core academics. So it's it is a it's a you know big you know Tetris puzzle. Uh, that you got to figure out how to put all that stuff together. Yeah. You mentioned um, your courses that you selected were part of your application. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're kind of thinking your kid wants to take a few AP courses, well, we'll be taking AP courses junior and senior year, mm -hmm. but they might want something to make it easier, like sign up for choir or save their PE credits for senior year. Mm -hmm. yeah. That looks bad on their application then because they save though, because they've got PE on there. Or? Yeah, that's a really, do you wanna? Yeah, yeah that's a great. So um, if you couldn't hear, the question was, um, for students who are you know working hard in junior and senior year, they're trying to elevate that rigor and take those honors and AP courses, um, like, does it look bad if they've maybe saved their PE or their you know choir classes to balance out their schedule? Um, it does not. So the colleges know, um, and that's what I mean generally speaking, but it doesn't look bad to have balance in your schedule. The colleges know what we require from your students. So they know your students have to take four credits of PE. So if they, by senior year, still need those two credits of PE, they absolutely are gonna have a year of PE in their schedule, and they'll see, oh, they're just meeting those requirements. Um, where it does start to you know, look a little bit like kind of smudging the schedule is if they've already completed those easier requirements, and they you know, got through their choir, and the, um, they completed their business tech and their PE, and then senior year, they're like, oh, can I be an office assistant? There's no homework, that sounds great. Depending on the student, and depending on you know, kind of their college trajectory, what they're looking at, we may advise against a certain class in their schedule to say, I don't know if this is gonna provide that right balance, and right, the, the image of continuing the rigor of their schedule. Okay, so you guys yeah, we oh, yeah. yeah, we, yeah. we talk to them, and um, especially for those juniors rising into senior year, one of the reasons why they are not meeting for another, you know, week plus is because they need that little bit of extra time to be having thoughtful conversations with you, with their teachers, um, and then with us to make those selections um, and feel really confident that the decisions they're making are going to help them with that graduation and onward to that. Yeah, so it's a great question. So the question is about taking that third year of a language, and so this is a this is kind of a tricky question, um, and I'm going to say it depends. But uh, the you know so sort of this this thought process is for colleges, and they're you know they're going to start to think a little bit more about this if they're uh, if they are thinking that looking at kind of college admissions uh, websites and stuff. They're going to find some colleges that are going to say we strongly recommend a third year of a language. And then they're going to have to say, like, okay, is this somebody, am I somebody that can, am I ready for that third year language, right? Because it's a big, it's a big jump, right? All of our third year languages are honors level. They're all UW in the high school, right? So they are kind of at a, they're at a really kind of high level of rigor already. Um, so if the students, you know, we have those rec recommended grades for, like, if they're in Spanish too, and they're, uh, you know, kind of at close to that, grade benchmark, the question I ask them is, number one, do you want to take a third year language? Is this even like, you know, something you're excited about? And that usually says a lot, because if they say, yes, I am, like, I want to do it, I love learning Spanish or German or French, I love this language, I love the teachers, I'm thriving in this, I know my grade maybe isn't fantastic, but I really want to put the effort in. I'm going to say, great, you're, you might be close to that recommended GPA, but that's probably going to be a class that you're going to do well in. Maybe not, maybe not get an A, but like you do, do fine, right? Um, and that's going to serve that student really well. Um, conversely, I've had students who have had, they're doing very well in, let's say, Spanish 2, and they come in and they say, I, there's no way I'm doing Spanish 3. Just, 
it's not going to happen. And I say, hmm. Okay. So, and then we'll, but we'll talk about like, okay, well, you know, like some colleges do recommend a third year language and it does, you know, the overall rigor in your schedule does matter. Um, any desire, what do you think about that? And they're just like, nope, not going to happen. So, okay. Um, so that's kind of part of that. That's sort of the, it, it can be a tricky question, right? And so what is the, um, what's the right decision? Like, I, I mean, it, it really, really depends on the student. It really depends on number one, are they ready? academically for that third year language. Do they want to keep going in that language? Do they actually have the, you know, kind of the desire to do it? Um, and then, you know, whether or not that's going to meet their college goals too. And I know that as sophomores, they don't really have those yet, so to speak. But um, yeah, any, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, kind of the big standout schools that um, this comes up with, um, University of Washington, for example, recommends a third year of a language. It is not required. So we have students admitted to the UW who do not have three years of a language, but at significantly lower rates. Um, but that's not the only reason. So um, very, very rare is third year of a language the only reason that a student is not admitted to um, those selective colleges. In addition to the UW, um, colleges like those public California schools. So the UC San Diego, UCLA, um, Berkeley, but again, these are highly, highly selective competitive admission schools. So your students might be saying, oh, well, I want to make sure I have the option to go to the public California schools. Awesome. So do tens of thousands of other students. So in kind of that package deal, does it would it make sense for you to have that school on your list or to be interested in that school? Keep that spark alive. Let's look into it. But if we're really challenged in something like a language um, or science and we're trying to decide, do I add this into my schedule? Because it's what's going to get me in. That's not what's going to get me in or keep me out. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a follow can, can I just clarify the language? Is it, is it three years or getting to, say, Spanish three? Oh, that's a really good question. Thanks for that, that question. So the question is, is it three years or is it getting to Spanish three? So let's say you're a, a student or maybe a transfer student who tested into um, Spanish two, right? And so freshman year, you're in Spanish two, sophomore year, you're in Spanish three, and you're kind of wondering like, oh, am I, do I, can I get off this train right now? Um, and yeah, sure, you can. Like it's, I think that it's, it's still the same conversation that we're having. It's like, do you want to do AP Spanish next year? And you know, if you took Spanish three, like, and you did the UW in the high school, and you're kind of like, no, I'm, I'm good. Um, that's a valid answer. So, and then it's almost the exact same answer that uh, Katie just gave in terms of when colleges are looking at it, they're going to say, I mean, you know, officially you took two years of a language, but they're going to see like, okay, you were you were at a high, you were an accelerated or accelerated language level. You did a UW in the high school. It's you know, you're checking that box off. It's fine. Yeah. So that and that does happen, I think, quite often. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a question about colleges that are visiting Blanchette. It's a little off agenda, but I'm going to answer the question. Uh, it's oh, totally fine. You're, you're totally fine. Um, so we have colleges that visit in the fall. Um, and we will give the students instructions on how to sign up for those meetings. So they sign up in advance. They'll get a visa to like get out of class if, if it's during class time, some of them during lunch. Um, and they'll come to the meeting and it's a, usually a small group meeting with a college admissions representative. Very often the college admissions rep that is uh, going to be reading the applications at a lot of, in a lot of these colleges uh, for our students. So the, student, the college rep that works with our region and our specific school is going to be the one that actually comes to visit our students and they get to know our students, answer questions, talk about their school. Um, those are open to juniors and seniors. Um, so if you have a current junior and you're kind of like thinking, okay, did they actually come to any of these meetings? Maybe not. That's totally fine. They didn't have to. Um, we find that especially at the start of junior year, I mean, first week of junior year, I think is a pretty, you know, it's kind of tough to be like, yeah, I'm going to go visit a bunch of, or like come to a bunch of college meetings, but they're running all the way through, um, November, mid November, I would say. So this could be something as seniors, great time to make that visit. Um, schools that are on their list or schools they want to learn more about, uh, we'll give them all the instructions in uh, like the first couple, uh, first week of the school year on how to do that. So if you have current sophomores, you're thinking I would like for them to come to one of these meetings, remember this because we will give them instructions 
um, first week of school on how to sign up for those. We give them some reminders about it too. But it is, I think it's, juniors get a lot out of it and we do have a lot of juniors that come to these meetings but it's it's kind of a, I mean, it's early in the year for them and I think early in the process sometimes. So, which is totally fine, totally fine. Do you want to take that one? Yeah, um, if your student goes into, uh, whether it's a UW online school or the AP level uh, of a language and they're not doing so well, um, can they get out of it? So if you were just our student coming in, we'd be like, probably not. What's going on? Um, that's, that's kind of where we would start. But really, we have the um, in-depth conversation, not only with the student, but with the teacher. Um, it is very rare that we are just willy-nilly moving students out of those honors and AP classes uh, in the middle of the year. Um, once in a while, it's the right move. So if they've got a lot going on outside of school or experiencing some mental health concerns, we've had you know, some family concerns going on, there are instances in which that's the right move. But more likely than not, we're setting up times for that student to meet with the teacher to investigate, okay, what's going wrong in this scenario? Are we struggling with our quizzes and test grades? Is it the, you know, are we feeling overwhelmed with the homework? Can we work with the tutors? So we're really trying to implement those support mechanisms as not only a learning opportunity for the student to help them overcome the challenge and to learn the material, but also for those purposes of like sticking it out and helping that, you know, the rigor of their curriculum and their schedule being a part of that application. We would have to explain that to a college to show why in the middle of the year did this student um, move away from an honors or AP course. Yeah, we, we definitely don't want students to think like, hey, I'm going to try this. If it doesn't work out, I'm going to take the other class. That's not a great, yeah, we, that's yeah, not a strategy and, we want to encourage. And specifically for language, um, by the time they're getting the opportunity to take the AP, they know the teachers in those subjects. Um, we only have a couple language teachers in each language. Um, so by the time they're there, those teachers can make pretty educated guesses about whether or not that student is ready to thrive in the AP level, or if they're not. Yeah. And, and they are not shy about saying, like, I do not think this is a good idea for you. Um, or if someone's on the fence, they're like, I know you can do this. I know you're speaking ability. I know you're writing ability in this language. Um, I don't think this is going to be too much for you. So leaning on their expertise in that forecasting process, I think, is huge. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Is there always an option for honors or AP? Or that's a good question. And like what's, what's the difference? That's a really good question. So um, honors versus AP, what's the difference? I kind of forget sometimes that not everybody looks at this. Stuff. Yeah, <laughs> like a, yeah, I know, right? It's like, well, this is all just like everything we do all the time. Um, and you guys are not in that world. Uh, so an honors class is simply an accelerated class. So it's a, you're going more in depth. You're going maybe further in material. Um, you're doing, if it's a, like an honors English uh, freshman, sophomore year, you're reading an extra book. You're doing an extra pretty significant paper uh, during the year. Uh, but the workload's more right, uh, for an honors class. AP is uh, advanced placement, it's an actual program, it's a, a curriculum that's designed by College Board and the AP program that we, we kind of teach that. And we have a, you know, flexibility in how we teach it, but we still have to get to a certain point. So honors classes um, are, like we have total freedom in terms of how we teach those and what we teach. AP is a little more standardized, right, or quite a bit more standardized, and we're teaching for preparation for the AP exam at the end of the school year. So that's kind of the pathway for AP. But it does mean AP, generally speaking, is quite a bit more rigorous than our standard uh, college prep courses. And I think arguably a little bit harder than uh, an honors course, but there's quite a bit of variation there. So that's part of the, I mean, I'm glad you brought this up. Um, the, um, and the folks who left early, man, they're missing good content here. I gotta tell you, they just, if you're listening to this and you left and you're listening to the recording, you're just like, I should have st stuck around. That's, that's fine, I forgive you. Um, so uh, the, oh God, I just made that little riff and I totally forgot what I was gonna say. Um, so the, to, the, uh, to the question, yes. not, every, every class doesn't necessarily have an honors. Correct, yes. So for example, world history, I think there's just regular world history, yep. and 
That is correct. So there is, yeah, so there, there's not going to be a regular or a college prep, an honors, and an AP. It's going to be, uh, in, in most cases, one or the other, right? Um, or, or neither, frankly. Like, there are some classes that don't have an honors or an AP version of them. Um, but maybe there's, like, in physics, we have a regular physics, we have a phys AP Physics 1, and we have an AP Physics C. Right? And those are all different classes. So um, that's where the kind of course catalog and looking at that course flow kind of comes in because you can see like, okay, this is where, this is how this is organized. What I was going to say is that um, a, not all AP are created equal. So there's some AP classes that are very difficult. And there are some AP classes that really are pretty manageable for most, like the, the majority of our students, even students who maybe wouldn't have otherwise been a good candidate for an AP and, class. And the level of that, you can even assess that looking in the course catalog because some of our AP classes have very significant prerequisites. So for example, uh, AP Chemistry, AP Physics C, um, you have to be taking calculus in order to take those classes or completed calculus and have certain grade point averages to be allowed to sign up. And then there's classes like AP World History and AP Computer Science Principles, where you can go in at your leisure, you can decide to take that class. Um, you don't have to have any prior knowledge of computer science to take that AP course for that world history. Sometimes that's a great opportunity for students who are like, I did pretty good freshman year. Mm -hmm. I think I'm ready to challenge myself. AP World History is not the same level as AP US History for that junior year class. So like uh, Stephen was saying, they are scaffolded also by grade level. So a sophomore year AP class, that AP World History, is going to be less rigorous than AP Government Politics in senior year. Um, but that being said, passing those AP tests with certain scores, whatever grade level you took them in, you can earn college credit. And, and just to kind of piggyback off that, just to make sure we're all on the same page. So AP, uh, the, one of the requirements of taking one of our AP courses is that you actually sit for the exam at the end of the year. Um, there really aren't any exceptions to that. It's, it's totally fine because the AP tests are only going to be seen by your student um, and we get a report, uh, but they don't have to send those to colleges and, and I would say they, and they're not really used in the admissions review process. Um, if they do well enough on the AP exams, they may get credit uh, or maybe a, like a course waiver at a college, depending on what college they go to and what their specific policies are. Um, so if a student is worried about taking an AP class because they don't want to take the AP test, we just say don't worry about it. Like you can just, I mean, I don't really want a student to sit, sit for a test and like not take it, but I mean, you could, like it's not really, it's not going to cost you anything. You can get a one, that's fine. Um, but usually by the time they get to the end of the year, they're feeling a little more confident. They've done a lot of practice on it and they're going to be like, okay, great, I got it. And they'll, you know, most of the time they do pretty well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's a really good question. Yeah. No, I mean, so, so, the, so like, your, your, maybe your son's uh, science teacher is encouraging them to continue along to AP Chem. Um, and our, you know, kind of going back to this idea that we're, we want students to maintain kind of a level of rigor. So from our perspective, I, I'll say this from, like, me as a, as a counselor, a school counselor, and someone who, like, supports students in their uh, college applications, um, I'm looking at their rigor and when I say two honors or AP classes, um, or three, or I mean sometimes four, but like one or two, right, we're kind of maintaining rigor, it's across the entirety of their schedule. So some years it might be, maybe they're taking honors um, English and uh, AP World History, but then junior year, maybe they're gonna take AP Language and Composition and then um, an AP Science course, right? So it doesn't necessarily have to be, you don't, you're not locked into that one, like taking honors in AP in that one area. But I mean, if you're doing pretty well and you like that subject area, maybe you continue along, yeah, right? Well, Does that make sense? What we don't wanna yeah. see is um, students doing well in those areas and then dropping off, deciding, oh, well, I you know, got a 4 in AP World History, but eh, US History is fine. We want to see if they're demonstrating success in those higher level classes. We, as just their supportive entity, and also from the college perspective, we want to see them continue in those higher level courses 
in the areas where they're doing well. And conversely, if they're not doing so well, that's a great opportunity to say, here's the balance. Okay, let's not you know, force ourselves to say, I'm gonna take this class because I think I should, but more so let's revisit what is kind of this picture as a whole and figure out where are your strengths, where can you challenge yourself, and then where can we pull back in a way that makes sense. Do you have a question over there? I yeah. Make sure I understand the AP classes. Okay. So you get a score from the, the grade of the school. Yes. And then based on the school exams, yeah. and then separately you do the AP exam. Yes. You get an AP score, and that score you can choose, or you can choose to send or not to send. Yep. You nailed it. And I'll just say it again so if you guys didn't hear it. So uh, for AP, for an AP class, you're going to get a grade in the AP class. It's going to be on your transcript, factored into your GPA, weighted into your weighted GPA. So that's what a college is going to see. They're going to see the grade you get in the AP class. At the end of the, the year, you're going to take the AP test, and you're going to get a score between 1 and 5. And that, you can decide whether or not to send to a college. So that's going to be just, you'll, you'll see, you, your student will see that, you'll see that, we'll see that, but colleges won't necessarily see that. And then they can you know, decide whether or not to send those in. Um, in, uh, in basically, this, either in, they can self-report them in their applications. They definitely don't have to. No, they really come in and yeah. when, when students are, have already chosen the college they're going to attend, they put in their deposit, they commit it to a school, um, at that point they can choose to share their AP scores, and then depending on the college, they will award them based on that score, um, potentially the credit or a waiver okay. uh, to college classes. So the last question right there. Yeah, that's, so, so the question was um, the UW chemistry, so UW um, honors, UW chemistry in the high school. We also have that same designation of courses for our um, year three in the language. So German, French, and Spanish all have um, UW in the high school honors level um, of that, from that language. Um, those courses are more rigorous than traditional honors classes. Um, you can pay for, um, through that process, University of Washington credit for that class, um, and you are following the University of Washington curriculum for that class. So it is rigorous, it is very challenging, and that's the reason why those UW and the high school honors classes in our weighted GPA receive the same designation as an AP course, because they are essentially the same rigor as an AP course. Um, but I will say for the, those that are most applicable for sophomores would be the UW um, chemistry, and your student's teacher is going to be the one who's going to recommend whether or not that is the right fit. That is not a forced thing. So they may say, hey, I'm going to forecast you for that you have in the high school chemistry. But through the conversation with you and with their counselor, your student can decide whether or not that is the class they're ready to take or if they want to take that traditional chem. So uh, thanks for coming. One last thing. Is, this is maybe more for folks listening along at home, if you're still doing that. Um, if you guys have questions, we'd love for you to write them down, give them to your student, talk them over with your student, and then have your student bring that in for their meeting with us. Um, and I, we, not that we don't want emails. We love emails, I guess. They have their own purpose. But um, I think at this point, since we haven't had the meetings yet, make sure your student brings those questions in to their meeting with their counselor. 99% um, of those questions are going to be super easy to answer with your student there. They'll know what they need to forecast for, and they're going to leave with everything set and ready to go. And if, again, if they're outstanding questions after that, we will get everybody on the same page. Um, so with that in mind, thanks for everybody for coming. Have a great evening. I don't know if the, the boys' game's over yet, but hopefully they did well. Um, and have a great rest of your week. Thank you and good night. Thank you and good night. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Got it. Okay. Hey. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, hey, hey. Okay. Yeah, sure. I'm trying to stop my